Mr. Charles Foster Kane, in every essence of his social beliefs and by the dangerous manner in which he has persistently attacked the American traditions of private property, initiative and opportunity for advancement, is, in fact, nothing more or less than a communist. That same month in Union Square... In the words Charles Foster Kane are a menace to every working man in this land. He is today what he has always been uh, and always will be, a fascist. And still another opinion. Wells has always resisted attempts to find autobiographical references in his work, but there's one major theme in Citizen Kane that has been a lifelong obsession with Wells himself. During his Hollywood years, he was actively involved in politics, speaking at anti-fascist rallies, broadcasting political commentaries on the radio, writing his own daily column for the New York Post, and actively campaigning for Roosevelt. I didn't, didn't run for the Senate for several reasons, the m most cogent of which, perhaps, is the fact that I didn't believe anybody... You see, if you run for the Senate, everybody who does, in their hearts, hopes that they might pros possibly get to the top, you know. You, I have to admit that's... If you're going to run for the Senate, you've got your eye on that big building. And uh, I didn't think anybody could get elected president who had been divorced and who had been an actor. <laughs> I made a hell of a mistake. <laughs> Both directions. <laughs> and uh, the thing on my conscience is that it was we, Roosevelt was very anxious for me to run. And there was a study made. In the California, I had uh, the, the, uh, the Southern California communist, Beverly Hills communist division was against me. I was a dangerous revisionist. And uh, I only had the North. And my advisor in California about how to run was Alan Cranston, who later became the senator. So I don't think he was totally disinterested. So it was finally discovered that the best place for me to run was Wisconsin, where I was born. And we made a study of that and discovered that the dairy interests, who I felt I had to fight, were so powerful that I would almost certainly be beaten unless I was the greatest campaigner ever known. But now supposing I was the greatest campaigner ever known. Because if I had been, there never would have been Joe McCarthy. He was the candidate who ran on the Republican ticket and got in. So I have that on my conscience. Maybe I could have run and beaten him and there never would have been a McCarthy. What happened to that political activity? The political activity stopped when I had to go to um, Europe and earn, earn my money to pay the taxes. Go right in there. You gotta close the doors after you. Nobody else must come in. In 1962, Wells was offered his own choice of subject for a film in Europe. He picked the novel by Kafka, The Trial. You should have been here one hour and five minutes ago. These delays must not occur again. Please step up. Anthony Perkins plays Kay, the faceless clerk persecuted by an incomprehensible legal system. The film was seen by many critics as a kind of contest between Wells and Kafka, with Kafka coming off second best. You are a house painter? No. <laughs> it wasn't very long into the project before I realized that uh, Orson's view of Joseph K. was that far from being the innocent victim of um, bureaucracy that uh, Kafka had written, that but in Orson's uh, version, uh, and I can hear him saying, I can hear his thundering voice, he's guilty as hell. I said, well, guilty of what? He said, of everything. Of, he's guilty of everything. Well, this certainly is a, a revolutionary view of Joseph K. It made it rather difficult to play. Uh, I said, you know, I don't think this is going to be a very popular concept of Joseph K. He said, well, I can't repeat what he said, but it was definitely not one he was going to be shaken from. So I decided in... in um, deference to Orson's judgment, I would get right behind it and play it that way. Ms. Brosner? You are a 
expecting Miss Personer? Why, no, no. No, what a what an idea. Of course not. You spoke her name just now. When? When I came in. You addressed me as Miss Personer. Well, that's that's her room, you know. Uh, what 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 are you doing in there? Well, who are you? What are you doing in here? Miss Personer frequently comes through that door. Frequently? The night. No, no, never, never. That that door is kept permanently locked. Um, um, Mrs. Grubach keeps the key. Just just ask her. Where is she? Does she know about you? Mrs. Grubach? Mrs. You were expecting Mrs. Grubach? No, no. I'm not expecting anybody, least of all you, whoever the hell you are. Where are you going? Well, I think that Mrs. Grubach would like to know that there are strange people wandering around her apartment in the middle of the night. If you make an opera of Othello, you have a right. If you're Verdi to make a great one, or if you're Bellini to make a good one, or if you're Jack Shemokin to make a bad one, but you can make your own opera out of that play. And the same thing goes for movies. I don't believe in, in an essential reverence for the original material. It's simply part of the collaboration. And uh, I felt no need to be true to Kafka in every essence. I thought it was necessary to capture what I felt to be the Kafka atmosphere, which is a combination of modern horror creeping up on the Austro-Hungarian Empire. I saw it as a European story, full of old European bric-a-brac, with uh, IBM machines lurking in the background. And that was the way I wanted to present the picture. Can you tell me how to get out of here? I've had enough of this place. You're going already, but you have hardly seen anything yet. I don't want to. I just want to get out of here. Well, you keep to the right, through that passage, and then you go... Well, it's a strange picture. I, 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 it's, it's, it's an uncomfortable movie to watch. The most interesting screening I ever ha experienced was when I was sitting with Orson. I don't know what year it was, in the early 70s, in Paris when they revived it and they gave him some award or something. And uh, Jean Moreau was there, she gave him the award. And they, and they ran the picture and started, you know, it was a terribly respectful audience, sort of like sitting at the Museum of Modern Art, you know, very um, cinephile and upper class kind of wealthy people who wanted to appreciate the finer things in art. And, um, and Orson sitting next to me, roaring with laughter. <laughs> the movie started and he started screaming of course I he'd always told me he thought it was funny but sitting next to him you know you I started to laugh too and I think Sybil was with us she was laughing we're all laughing and the, the entire audience kind of you know la we're laughing at this movie that he made and they're thinking God, those people don't have any appreciation of art <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I'm afraid you won't find any subversive literature or pornography. Don't touch those record albums. What's this thing? That's my pornograph. My phone... What's this? What's what? A circular line with four holes. Circular. No, it's not really circular. It's more ovular. Don't write that down. Ovular. For sake. Why not? Ovular. We can't not write it down just because you say we shouldn't. Ovular isn't even a word. You deny that there's an ovular shape concealed under this rug? He denies everything. The, the humor in the wordplay, which happens early on, there she is, is not. I don't Grubach. know whether... No, that's entirely that's, mine. That's well. No, there's nothing of that kind in Kafka. Yeah. It's uh, very solemn. It may be funny in German, but it certainly isn't in English. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't want the others to hear about it. Oh, now you want money, I suppose. Well, you've got the wrong man. That's what they all say. I mean, the opening I mean, sequence, for example, it's all one long take. Did that kind of thing take an enormous amount of rehearsal? Sheer nerve. Sheer nerve and Orson coming up to you at 3 o'clock in the morning in the back of the car where you've been sitting. We had no dressing rooms or anything like that. To say, look, there's only enough film for two takes. It's got to be right. You've got to do it uh, perfectly and let's go. I mean, he, he, he has a field marshal's um, affection for the troops, in this case the crew, the actors, the extras. He, a wonderful manipulator, and I mean that in the best sense, of, of people and their soft spots and the, and the ways to, to get them behind his uh, vision of things. You were talking about working, making love to actors. Um, I mean, I think 
from what I hear of you from actors, you do it far more than any other director to the extent that you will kind of stay up all night with your leading players, that you will invite a kind of collaboration that seems to me quite, really quite unusual with and we run out of film. <laughs> you had oh, me, I must tell you. I, I, I'd be riveted. <laughs> <laughs> I love I it. You. Don't cut a word out of it. <laughs> Come, sing me a body song to make me mad. Don't forget me when I'm gone. You stop me weeping if you say so. Kiss me, darling. Wells as Falstaff, perhaps his greatest performance, certainly one of his finest films, chimes at midnight. It's strange that desire should so many years outlive performance. Well, oh, just give me flattering voices. I kiss thee with the most constant heart. I am old. I love thee better than I love our scurvy young boy of them all. I was supposed to have Jack. my scenes with Orson. I would wait in one day and then two days and then three days and each time Orson would apologize and would come to the hotel and take me out for dinner and we would talk about all sorts of things but the film. So I finally I said, but what's going on, Orson? He says, well, I'm sorry, my darling, but I, we can't do our scenes yet. I don't have my makeup. My little suitcase, you know, my little suitcase with all my makeup has been lost. I said, are you sure? He says, of course I am sure. So maybe we shoot tomorrow, but we do the shots, reverse shots on you without me. I said, well, Orson, it's quite difficult. We haven't started. And you're going to start with close-ups on me. He said, well, what can I do? You'll manage, you'll manage. Okay. So I arrive at the studio, and in one of those little boxes where they were supposed to uh, put the cars. That was the makeup room. And then Orson's uh, secretary calls me because she wanted to give me some new lines. So I go into this little shabby room, and while she's fumbling amongst the papers, looking for the papers uh, Orson had left for me, I sat on the floor. There was no chair. And what did I see? Under a very old settee, Orson's makeup kit, hidden. Oh, I said, look. So she jumped around and she said, shh, don't say it, don't say it. It's been hidden for days. So in fact, as an actor, he had stage fright and he was hiding himself and he said that he didn't have his makeup. So finally, after two hours of shooting, I said, you know, Orson, I've discovered everything. I know where the makeup is. Oh, I said, you. So what am I going to do? You know, it takes me two hours to do my makeup. I said, we have time. Why don't you do it? And we'll do the first scene, the two of us. It's a famous scene when Dal Tersheet is jumping on the bed on top of Falstaff. So finally, we get to that scene, and we rehearse. But he was not in the on the couch. It was somebody else. And then finally, we say, shoot. And I jump on him, and he screams, and he says, you've destroyed my nose. Cut, cut, we can't do it today. Wells plays against the traditional Falstaff, the lying, drunken clown. He creates a character who's flawed and overindulgent, but also intelligent and humane. And his final rejection becomes the more poignant because of it. Have you your wits? No, you are you say. My king! My Joe! I speak to thee, my heart. I know thee not, old man. Fall to thy prayers. How ill white hairs become a fool and jester. I have long dreamed of such a kind of man, so surfeit swelled, so old, and so profane. 
But being awake, I do despise my dream. Falstaff, I think, is the most unusual figure in fiction in that he is almost entirely a good man. He is a gloriously life-affirming good man. And there are very few gigantic silhouettes on the horizon of fiction who are good. They are always flawed. They are always, uh, they are always interesting because of their, of their, uh, of what is wrong with them. And Falstaff is, I don't, somebody once said that Falstaff was Hamlet who stayed in England and got fat, you know, which is amusing to think of, but I don't think it's true because uh, Hamlet is not a good man, I don't think. And uh, I, there is hardly a good man in, in dramatic literature who dominates a whole, a whole scene. And Falstaff is, I think, really Merry England. I think, he, I think Shakespeare was greatly preoccupied, as I am in my humble way, with the uh, loss of innocence. And uh, I think there has always been in England an older England, which was sweeter and purer, where the hay smelt better and the weather was, was always springtime and the daffodils blew in the gentle warm breezes and it's the, you feel the nostalgia for it in Chaucer and you feel it all through Shakespeare and I think that he was profoundly against the modern age as I am. I'm against my modern age, he was against his. And I think his villains are modern people, just as they're likely to be continental. I always see that the villains in Lear are non-Anglo-Saxon. They are from over there, and they, are from, they represent the modern world, which includes gouging out eyes and sons being ungrateful to their fathers and all the rest of it. I think, uh, I think he was a, a typically English writer, arch-typically, the perfect English writer, in that very thing, that, that preoccupation with that Camelot, which is the great English legend, you know. It's, and innocence is what Falstaff is. He is, he is a kind of refugee from that world. And he has to live by his wits. He has to be funny. He has no, he, he, he doesn't, uh, he hasn't a place to sleep if he doesn't get a laugh out of his patron. So it's a rough modern world that he's living in. But I think you have to see in his eyes. That's why I was also very glad to be doing it in black and white because if it's in color, he must have blue eyes, you know. You've got to see that, uh, that look that comes out of, of the age that never existed but exists in the heart of uh, all English poetry then that rough modern world explodes into one of the most violent, I think, battles. Terrible battle scene, yes. Uh, which is, a, is supposed to show the end of the chivalric idea, you know. It's supposed to show the way it's going to be from now on. Even the funny tin can running about, which is full yeah. stuff in his armor, but it's funny, pathetic. It's not yeah. a belly laugh. It's supposed to be, yeah.
know fact is that the that Hotspur, another refugee from Camelot, is dead. And the BDI Tudor is getting ready to be an English hero, you know? And to build that establishment under which Shakespeare must have struggled because it was a very real establishment. All that was done by terribly good technicians, you know. And so the cutting. I was, I was well. awfully lucky. What? And the cutting, the editing. Yeah. Well, I did that. That's what it's made of. It's, you know, if it hadn't been cut, it would have... You can't imagine what a sad... How sad the, the beginning and end of each shot was. You know? <laughs> Pitiful in all the wrong senses of the word. <laughs> Showing a lot of tired gypsy extras turning around wondering whether they were going to eat. <laughs> it, it seems that the chimes of midnight gives you particular pleasure to. In my favorite picture, yeah. If I, if I, uh, if I wanted to, uh, to get into heaven on the basis of one movie, I would, I would, uh, that's the one I would offer up. I think it's because I, th because it is to me the least flawed. Let me put it that way. It is the most successful for what I tried to do. I succeeded more completely, in my view, with that than with anything else. Two years after *Chimes at Midnight*, Jean Moreau appeared in another Wells film, *The Immortal Story*, playing a woman hired to bring a fiction to life. Wells is Mr. Clay, a wealthy but friendless old man obsessed with a piece of sailor's folklore, the story of a penniless young man who's paid five guineas to sleep for one night with a woman he's never met. Now, my young friend, I'm going to tell you why I fetched you here. I know. I know what you're going to tell me, old master. I've heard it before, every word. I kind of believe that the sailor's story existed before Karen Blix and Isaac Dinnison wrote it. I mean, no, no, I've heard I'm, that story. I, it, you've heard it? I've heard it. So Literally written... by a sailor on a tramp steamer. That's what made my hair stand on end when I read it. I've heard it told as though it really happened. By a sailor. I swear to you, it's still being told. It is the immortal story. And you and I are the same age. Mr. Clay can't accept that the story never really happened, and he commits the folly of trying to bring it to life. You're young. Both of you are young. You're in fine health. Your limbs don't ache. You sleep at night because you move without pain. You think you move at your own will. Not so. You move at my bidding. The two young, strong, and lusty jumping jacks. And this old hand of mine. It's very tempting to see Mr. Clay almost, um, he's played by the director, but to see him as a kind of... As a director, as he is a kind of director, isn't he? Yes. And, uh... <laughs> It's very tempting to show it as the total uselessness of the director's job, too. <laughs> do, you, do, you actually, do you actually think um, the, the director is overrated? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I think the... the <coughs> uh, I think uh, there are the exceptions are the exceptional directors of which there are very few in the, up to now. But the actual job of the director in 99% of all movies is uh, minimal. It's the only really easy job around. It really is, you know. And if you, you, you can fool the people for years if you're a good producer. The, the director who is by nature a good producer 
can make a great name for himself and live to a great age covered with glory and honors and never be found out because uh, a movie can be made by the actors or by the cutter or by the author. The best movies are made by the director. In 1949, Wells had acted in a film for the British director, Carol Reed. He created one of the most memorable anti-heroes of all time, the racketeer, Harry Lyme, the third man. He dominates the picture, although he's actually on screen for less than 10 minutes. He doesn't even turn up until the fourth reel, but when he does, it's one of the most magical appearances in cinema. What kind of a spy do you think you are, Satchel Foot? What are you tailing me for? Cat got your tongue? Come on out. Come out, come out, whoever you are. Step out in the light and let's have a look at you. Who's your boss? You're some dead, no one. What's this that loose? Sounds was bald in you, Rob Dain. Sounds it tepid? Yeah, see, meine ich schon's nicht so blöd. Eine Frechheit ist das mitten in der Nacht zu einem Krawall zu machen. Harry! Eine Frechheit ist das zu einem Krawall zu machen. Yes, you were saying about uh, about it being rare for for uh, directors to, to to be very fond of actors and acting, and I was saying that uh, Carol Reed, nobody ever loved acting more than he did, and and was passionately interested in uh, in uh, his actors and in the process of acting, without the remotest feeling that he was imagining himself in that position or imposing himself. He was the real actor's director. His joy was in your work, not in seeing something of his come to life. He was exceptional in that case. Old man, you never should have gone to the police, you know. You ought to leave this thing alone. Have you ever seen any of your victims? You know, I never feel comfortable on these sort of things. Victims? Don't be melodramatic. Look down there. Would you really feel any pity if one of those dots stopped moving forever? If I offered you 20,000 pounds for every dot that stopped, would you really, old man, tell me to keep my money? Or would you calculate how many dots you could afford to spend? Free of income tax, old man. Free of income tax? The only way you can save money nowadays. A lot of good your money will do you in jail. That jail's in another zone. There's no proof against me. Besides you. And did he invite uh, your collaboration? Oh, yes. Line? He invited everybody's collaboration, as I do. That's why I loved working. His style was so much like mine in the respect that he wanted. He wanted uh, any suggestion he could get. I, I always, I, the, the, you know, I've, I can tell you scenes in, in, uh, in pictures of mine that were suggested by members of the crew. You know, anybody can make a suggestion. That doesn't mean they get to have it in the picture, but if it's good, it goes. Sure. And he welcomed it. And uh, so that uh, at an earlier time when I was being in interviewed in another language, I gave the impression that I'd somehow co-directed my scenes with, and that's not true. And uh, I never meant to say that or give that impression. Uh, I was, however, to a large extent, the author of the dialogue of Harry Lyme, including the cuckoo clock and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Don't be so gloomy. After all, it's not that awful. But what the fella said, 
In Italy, for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love. They had 500 years of democracy and peace. And what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. So long, Howard. But that is what I do when I act in other people's pictures. I never argue about the direction, but I usually come up with a rewritten scene. That's the headache they have to put up with. And then if they don't like it, I'll go back to the other. But I, I, I go back home at night and write next day's scene, hope they'll take it instead of what it is. But I never would tell a director, would you do that or something, unless they asked me. Do directors often tell you how to do things when you're acting? Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. Or, or, or uh, I had one director in, in, in England who yeah, was wonderful. About half the way through every take, he'd say, Cut. <laughs> Cut. There'd be a long silence, and I'd look at him, you know. I'd say, How would you like me to do it? Just, just do it again. So we'd do it again, and then there'd be this cut. We went through the whole picture like that, and I never, I never knew what was giving him this pain. <laughs> what? Um... Well, the directors get up to such things, you know. Some directors are great actors of being directors. René Clément, for example, is absolutely superb. He's like Lenny Bernstein or Van Karajan, you know, when he tells you how to sit in the chair and so on. It's just wonderful to watch. And uh, Houston is the most fascinating of all actor-directors because his performance of a director is so awe-inspiring and unnerving. It's, it's absolutely marvelous because it's at once tremendously charming and attractive and t terrifying. You know? <laughs> in one picture, I've made a lot of pictures with him, made five pictures with him, and directed him in another. And uh, in the, in the la one, I think one of the last pictures, he, was, he was, had a penthouse above the stage. And while they were relighting, he would go up to his penthouse. And then, slowly, they would get a silence on the set we would realize that John had come back, that there would be a voice that would say, all right, roll them. Action. Then cut. He would go away in the darkness again. Well, everybody was speechless, you know, we were. <laughs> he could get up to the damnedest things you can imagine, you know, because he's a virtuoso actor of being a director. Wells acted for the first time for John Huston in 1956, playing Father Mapple in Huston's Moby Dick, a project Wells himself had once wanted to direct. I was having trouble writing uh, Father Mapple into the, into the script, and um, it was, became a kind of stumbling block for me, and a, and a blind area, and I tried, it didn't satisfy me, and I tried again, it didn't work. and. Um, uh, I told Orson this, and he said, well, let me, let me take a whack at it. And did, and it was, it was excellent. He's a fine writer, by the way. Anyway, he, he, he wrote the scene, quite to my satisfaction. And it was a long scene. It went on, I think, for about six pages uh, of a sermon. It was shot in, shot in England, the studio. And we had the congregation there at the church. And uh, Orson... I uh, had difficulty getting up into the pulpit. There was a rope ladder. The, the pulpit was supposed to be like the figurehead of a whaling vessel. But finally he made it. He, he got up there with his, the pages, the script on the pulpit in front of him and turned pages and, and um, whispered lines and, and uh, finally said, John, he said, I've never been so nervous. Uh, I don't know how to account for it, but I'm just all, all nervous. Could I have a drink? I said, what would you like? Well, brandy. So I sent out and got a bottle of brandy, and we put it in the pulpit. <laughs> and um, 
uh, Orson uh, referred to the bottle of brandy three or four times, and, and um, I said, well, should we have a rehearsal? And uh, he said, ah, no, let's just, let's just try and shoot it. <coughs> so I said, all right. He started the scene. Orson went through those six pages. To every I dotted and every T crossed. He was superb. And a beautiful rendering it was. And eternal delight shall be his. Who coming to lay him down can say, Oh, Father, mortal or immortal, here I die. I have striven to be thine more than to be this world's or my own. Yet this is nothing. I leave eternity to thee. For what is man? That he should live out the lifetime of his God. Have you found yourself turning down, really, substantial parts because you wanted to get on with directing? No, I haven't been offered them. I would have sold my soul to play The Godfather, for instance. But I never get those parts offered to me at all. Why, why have you accepted so many parts, no matter how well you may have done them in the end, that were uh, basically live. from bad scripts? To live. I have to live in the, you know, if you're, if you're going to, if you're going to try to, uh, finance movies and live, you have to earn your money somehow. And I've done, most of my movies have been movies I didn't want to make. I've never done a movie that I disapproved of morally. The last star part that I was offered was Caligula. And I refused it on moral grounds. And yet there I would have been playing uh, the leading part in an eight million dollar picture. And it would have been nice to do that, but I, I didn't even have a moment's doubt about not doing it. And the same thing would be for a political reason or anything like that. I've turned down a lot of things for those kind of reasons, but no great parts. I haven't had any great parts offered me, only a few good ones in all these years. They hire me to, they hire me when they have a really bad movie and they want, uh, a cameo that'll give it a little class, you know. So every time I do one of those things, I chip off something more from me as an actor. It's a kind of, you know, you're in liquidation when you do that. And that's why I hope to avoid it. Now it looks as though I have a chance for, to direct a couple of more movies. And I've got a couple of good parts I've written for myself. It's the only, <laughs> only way I know how to get them. Else will. Yes. So I, I played all the great parts of the theater by by running, you know, there's an old, old Yiddish saying in the Yiddish theater that the star is the man who owns the store, you know? <laughs> so some of my stores have been rather uh, small establishments, but I, I was the star <laughs> because I owned it. Do you, have you also had bits chipped off you from, do, from doing commercials? And no, I don't think so at all. That's an English attitude. Uh, Larry does commercials in America, but not in, uh, in England. I know, there have been a lot of, every time they write about me now in a performance in an English paper, they talk about me, uh, my, uh, you know, my sh sherry. sherry voice or something. I think that's non nonsensical. I think, you know, painters have always made posters. Uh, why the hell shouldn't an actor sell a product that he thinks is a decent product and not a, and not a, uh, when you aren't cheating the public, it's perfectly legitimate use of, of your, uh, of what you have to sell. For my next experiment, ladies and gentlemen, I would appreciate the loan of any small personal object from your pocket, a key, a box of matches, a coin. Ah, here it is. Good, sir. Hold it up. Wells' most saleable commodity these days is himself, his own personality, and his unrivaled skill as a storyteller. Before our very eyes, a transformation. We've changed your key into a coin. What happened to the key? It's been returned to you. Look closely, sir. You'll find the key back in your pocket. 
May we see it, please? After your old tricks, I see. Why not? I'm a charlatan. What's that, sir? Did I used to be a magician? Sir, I'm still working on it. As for the key, it was not symbolic of anything. This isn't that kind of movie. Well, in effect, fact, you describe yourself as a charlatan. Yes, well, I describe myself as a charlatan in order. It was a complete trick, like everything in, the, in that movie, it was a trick, because I don't regard myself as a charlatan. Are we out of film? No. no. Uh, I said I was a charlatan in order not to sound pompous talking about all the charlatans that were in the movie. And that's why I did the magic and so on. I thought by saying charlatan, that will keep me from looking like some superior moral judge of uh, tricksters. I didn't think I was a charlatan, but a lot of very serious film uh, writers have taken that up and written at great length about Orson Welles as a charlatan, you see, out of his own lips and all of that. But that was the, that was the trick, too. It was all a trick. You do, Everything you... about that picture was a trick. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, by way of introduction, this is a film about trickery and fraud, about lies. Tell it by the fireside or in the marketplace or in a movie. Almost any story is almost certainly some kind of lie. But not this time. No, this is a promise. During the next hour, everything you'll hear from us is really true and based on solid facts. We don't talk about Napoleon or Julius Caesar. We're talking about Elmir. Elmir? Elmir? Who is Elmir? That question has yet to be answered with any real precision. It has that lovely magpie quality as well. You can, I mean, you got that film from another source. Completely. Yes, BBC. It is among us beautiful people. Everybody knows Elmir. But Elmir what? He has about 60 times the same name. De Hori? He's called his name Hori. And uh, I rushed over to BBC to look at it and bought the film and then bought also the, the outtakes. His real name was Elmir Ferenc Huffman. Then 60 personalities, as much lies and as much real. Well, <laughs> sounds very Jesuitic. <laughs> yes, his, his world is a world of make-believe. I'm not an actor. Not an actor? Help me. I'm not an actor. I am not a professional actor. He's a leading actor in this movie. His profession, it's true, is painting, painting fakes. Among all fakers, Elmir is number two. If I'd had more success with Afro Fake in uh, America, I would have been making only those kind of movies. When I finished Afro Fake, I thought I had discovered a new kind of movie, and it was the kind of movie I wanted to spend the rest of my life doing. And it was the failure of F for Fake it was one of the big shocks of my, in America, and also in England, was one of the big shocks of my life, because I really thought I was on to something. And uh, it's a form. The, the, in other words, the essay, the personal essay, as opposed to a documentary. Quite different from it, not a documentary at all. Remember? I did promise that for one hour, I'd tell you only the truth. That hour, ladies and gentlemen, is over. For the past 17 minutes, I've been lying my head off. In F for Fake, you you appear as Orson Welles, and you're the storyteller. Yeah. And I think, is it right in Don Quixote you appear? Yes. As the story yes story. and uh, it's very interesting that Cervantes set out to write a short story it's just by coincidence I set out to write a to make a short film but uh, the figure of Quixote seizes you and Sancho Panza and carries you forever you see there's no end to them as uh, but uh, they have become ghostly. They're starting to fade like an old movie, piece of old movie film. That's, that's what I'll have to make. We were talking about the essay film, mm. and uh, I, I, 
I haven't said that I'd like to do take another shot at it this time on the subject of Spain. Spain and the Spanish virtues and vices, especially virtues, because Cervantes wrote a figure of fun, a man who had gone mad reading old romances, and he ended up writing a night, a story about a knight, a real one. When you finish up with Quixote, you know that he's the most perfect knight who ever rode out against a dragon and it has taken tourism, you know, and modern communications and maybe even democracy to destroy this, if not destroy, at least to dim this extraordinary Spanish thing. That's That would be the subject of my essay on Quixote in Spain when I finish it and I'm going to because it won't cost much money and it's be a great pleasure to do and you know the title when are you going to finish Don Quixote it's what it's got to be called <laughs> because you've heard that somewhere before yes, so many times yes. before yes. yes since it's my own little picture that I put my own money on I don't know why they don't bug authors and say, when are you going to finish Nelly, that novel you started ten years ago? You know, it's my business. <laughs> <Or the internet. laughs> it does sound as if um, since you started it, which is about 25 years ago. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. But both, both the actors have died now. Yes, yeah, they're both dead. Yeah. But I don't, I don't need them. I, I need them because I love them. I don't need them for the movie. It sounds that the more time it takes, the more time changes your attitude to it. Of course, but, but Spain has changed, you see. Because for all the years of Franco's Spain, Spain was paralyzed. In other words, everything good and bad of the old Spain remained frozen, as in a fairy story. You know, nobody came and kissed the sleeping princess. Everybody was left in the gestures that they were making at the moment when when Madrid fell. And uh, I rejoice in what's happening in Spain. And like everybody in the world, and Spaniards in particular, who are my, I have more Spanish friends than anywhere else, I suppose. And all of them are absolutely astonished by, by uh, the success of democracy in that country. It's, but what happens to Quixote? It's very interesting. Mm. Could you describe to us at all then any of the sequences that you might have shot that, that just won't work anymore to your mind because of the way time... They're not very interesting if I tell them that way. I'm, I'm refusing the question because my, my uh, superior knowledge of the material, since you don't know it, tells me that we're headed in a boring direction. <laughs> <laughs> Wells has always refused to show any of Don Quixote until he's finished it. And besides, he admits he's not altogether sure where the various bits of it really are. Sometimes I try to imagine um, Orson having different bedrooms in different motels and hotels. And the doors to this room, bedroom is locked and under the bed are hidden, maybe because of the makeup kit I discovered, hidden, you know, boxes and boxes of film. Who knows? Jeanne Moreau starred in another Wells film that remains unseen, The Deep, completed in 1969 and never released. And John Huston acted in another unfinished project, this one held up by complicated legal tangles. It's called The Other Side of the Wind, the story of an aging and respected film director surrounded by admirers, but with a typical Wells irony, unable to find the money for his next picture. Orson hasn't made half as many movies as he wanted to and could have. <clears throat> but Orson, of anybody that I've known, should have been subsidized. He should have had a patron, somebody who just wrote the checks, you know, because uh, that's never been his bag dealing with getting the money and that's all he's had to do that's why so many so much of the time he spent his own money he just didn't want to be bothered with having to get it or he couldn't get it and he, he had a tremendous desire and urge to make pictures I think I, I made a uh, essentially a mistake 
in staying in movies because I but it it's the mistake I can't regret because it's like saying I shouldn't have stayed married to that woman but I did because I love her I, I would have been more successful if I hadn't been married to her you know I would have been more successful if I'd left movies immediately stayed in the theater gone into politics written anything I've, I've wasted the greater part of my life looking for money and trying to get along trying to make my work from this terribly expensive paint box which is a, a movie and I've spent too much energy on things that have nothing to do with making a movie it's about two percent movie making and 98 percent hustling it's no way to spend a life do you feel that's going to go on? Oh, I'm going to go on being faithful to my girl. I love her. I fell so much in love with making movies that the theater lost everything for me, you know. It's, I'm just in love with making movies. I'm not very fond of movies. I don't go, go to them much. I think it, it's very harmful to see movies for movie makers because you either imitate them or worry about not imitating them. And you should do movies innocently, the way Adam named the animals in the first day in the garden. And I lost my innocence. I, every time I see a picture, I, I, uh, I lose something. I don't gain. I never understand what, what directors mean when they compliment me, young directors, and say they've learned from my pictures, because I. I don't believe in learning from other people's pictures. I think you should learn from your own interior vision of things and discover, as I say, innocently, as though there had never been D.W. Griffith or Eisenstein or Ford or Renoir or anybody. Jean-Luc Godard, writing about Orson Welles. May we be accursed if we ever forget for one second that he, alone with Griffith, one in silent days, one sound, was able to start up that marvellous little electric train. All of us, always, will owe him everything. And to me, Orson is so much like a destitute king. And destitute king, not because he was thrown away from the kingdom, but on this earth, the way the world is, there's no kingdom that is good enough for Orson Welles. That's the way I feel. Stay with us now on BBC4. Our Orson Welles weekend continues with The Stranger next. <laughs> 